And um, I, I'd like for you to go away. He has some books out there as well. And they're listed on the back of the outline that you received and you came in today. And I, listen, folks, go out there and buy the tapes. They're not good, but buy them anyway. <laughs> because Don gets his feelings hurt if people don't buy his tapes. And uh, he really gets insulted. If you don't buy his tapes and books, he'll sulk and... And he'll call me later this week and complain, and I don't want to hear it, okay? So just go out there and just buy them all up and take them with you, and they'll bless you. No, I, I want to tell you that this is one man that has a deep insight into the Word of God. He, he writes outlines all the time, and um, he's been really good to me through the years to send me those outlines, and, and I preached them all over the world as if they were my own. And so if you go anywhere and preach any of your outlines, they're going to say, you stole that from Kerry Robertson. But uh, he, has a, he has a tremendous insight in Scripture. And uh, you'll be blessed by his humor. Um, get the series of tapes on marriage out there. I'll tell you, you have those with you, don't you? you, you hey, you just got to have that. Um, and uh, all the rest of them, and you'll be tremendously blessed. Um, it's a joy today to welcome to this pulpit Don Norman. Uh, I've known Don for a number of years, I don't know, 10, 12 years, maybe something like that. And um, I've learned to love him. He's from South Africa, so he talks funny. Uh, but that's okay. He lives down in Florida, but uh, lower, lower Florida, but um, he still talks funny. Um, he's, uh, he's a tremendous man of God. He comes from a varied background. He's an engineer by training um, and uh, a pastor and minister by calling. And uh, I've, I've heard him preach I don't know how many times. I've had him when I was a senior pastor to come to my church on numerous occasions, and he's always been a great blessing to us. And uh, he's spoken in this church before. He just was the main speaker at the men's conference down in Panama City. And uh, he's with us today. So would you welcome, please, Don Norman. Thank you. <clears throat> I um, don't know what to say about that, Pastor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I am, first of all, I'm a preacher, I'm a college professor, and I'm a comedian as well. But I'm, I'm not going to be foolish this morning. Is that all right? Even though I'm prompted by Pastor Kerry and what he does. I do write. In fact, I've written for John. And uh, there's a book on the table there that I, I, I wrote the script for John for, for Where Lions Feed. The little book's there. There's 17 stories about lions in Africa. I've just been back to Africa to open a 14,000-strong African church. There was a young man who was in my church who um, uh, I didn't think was going to add up to much, but uh, was become the greatest preacher in Central Africa. And uh, I went back to the jungle, and I, I know I could never shoot lion again. I've got softer now that I've turned 70. You know what I'm talking about? Even my wife says I've got softer, and she's taking advantage of it too. <laughs> Been married to the same woman for 50 years this February. <laughs> it hasn't been easy either. <laughs> but I've made it by God's grace. <laughs> you know the funny part about it, I never liked my mother-in-law. And every day, my wife is growing more like my mother-in-law. <laughs> but I'm learning to now to love my mother-in-law. One guy said to me the other day, he said, my mother-in-law is like an angel. <laughs> I said, you fortunate. Mine's still living, by God's grace. <laughs> my mother-in-law is 89 years of age, you know, brother. She just will not die. I have something serious to say, but I've got to tell you about it. One day I took her to a meeting. If she'd have come to a meeting like this, well, she fainted in a meeting when they just said amen. Could you imagine what she would have done if she'd have come here? 
church. And uh, I said, but mother, you know, in the Bible it says if we agree, we should say amen. She said, I will never say that I'm a Baptist. <laughs> well, we were on the Zambezi River in Africa as missionaries for a number of years. And my mother-in-law came to see us and we were going through the jungle and where there's a place where they're reputed to be about 33,000 elephants. And we'd gone through a herd and I'd come into a, a place where there were trees on either side and there was a rogue elephant standing in the middle of the road. And my mother-in-law was sitting with my wife and I in the front of the truck. And my mother said, what are you going to do? Well, I saw the elephant had got a fright. I don't know whether he'd got a fright because we'd come on him suddenly or because he'd seen my mother-in-law for the first time. <laughs> And uh, I knew that we were going to be charged. I've seen elephant uh, crush a vehicle before today. They just turn it over and knurl it with their big knees. And the guys in the glove box shouting, help, 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 you know. <laughs> so I treat them with utmost respect. They eat three ton of grass a day. <laughs> Never mind what they leave when they walk away. If you trip over one of those cannonballs, you can break a leg. <laughs> I could see my mother-in-law was really fearful for the first time in her life. And she said, what are you going to do? Now, my daddy taught me that animals in the bush give you a fair chance. He said, first of all, they give you a physical sign. They wave their ears. This is not part of my sermon, by the way. <laughs> and or they stamp their feet, they do something, say, please, will you leave? You're in my territory. And he went through that motion. Then he gave an audible sign that she screamed, which said, please, I told you once. And then they give a mock charge. At the mock charge, an elephant gets up to 40 miles an hour in a matter of seconds. And I, I, knew, I thought it was days up then, but then he turned for what is called the death charge, and he came down from the side. And I knew he was going to go right over us. And I began to pray what is called in the book of James, the effectual fervent prayer. <laughs> and I said, Jesus, help us now. And my little Baptist mother-in-law said, Amen, Lord, Amen, Amen. <laughs> that elephant just missed us and we got on our way. I don't know what it's going to take you to warm up, <laughs> but uh, an elephant will do it for you. I remember we got to camp that night, Pastor, and I said to my mother-in-law, I said, Mother, do you want some coffee? She said, Amen, Amen, Amen. <laughs> She's 89, and she goes to a Presbyterian church in England. I'm originally from Scotland. And um, she, the preacher said something good which was very seldom. <laughs> oh, I'm not picking on the Presbyterians. They mentioned in the New Testament when the dead in Christ shall rise. <laughs> he, he, he said something good. And my mother-in-law in that dead still quietness leaned out. She had an aisle seat and she said, Amen! And he lost his place in his notes. And they, they sent two deacons down to her, and they said to her, um, you can't do that here. She said, I've got religion. They said, shut up, you didn't get it here. <laughs> well, I tell you, coming to Brownsville is something else. It's like an elephant charge. <laughs> All right. I don't move as well as I used to, but I want to tell you what, that was good today. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want to speak to you this morning on a subject called the difference between faith and hope. It's a subject that's concerned me, worried me. I've not had many answers to it, and nobody could tell me. I, I just want to share this with you, and I feel it'll be a help to you. And we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 10, from verse 35, and then the first verse of Hebrews 11. I'll do this as quick as I can. 
Cast not away therefore your confidence, verse 35 of Hebrews 10. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, it will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and the blessing of God is on the reading of His Word. Can we bow our heads together and pray? Father, thank You for Your great presence here, for the blessings of Jesus Christ, who is greater than Moses, greater than Aaron, greater than Elijah, who is Your only begotten Son, raised from the dead and in Your presence on our behalf. Thank you that, Lord, today you will take this message and cause it to be a blessing to the people of God in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. As a text of Scripture, the, the well-known portion of Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let me tell you the difference between hope and faith. You can never have faith except you have hope first. Because faith is the outcome of hope. Hope, you need to record, is a human commodity. Hope is not a divine commodity, it is human. But faith is a divine commodity. You as a human being have no faith in you at all. You have only the ability to have hope. And when you take your hope to God, God will turn that hope into faith, which is an assurance of what you hope for. Hope, uh, let me put this to you, hope has several things to make it. One is, hope is believing. Believing is not faith, believing is hope. Hope has a desire. Hope is trusting. And when Jesus said, thy faith hath made thee, from the original of the Greek, it means your sense of trust in me, your hope in me. But faith is a divine substance. You and I as human beings haven't got it. You don't get it from Tulsa. You don't get it from going to a faith convention. You get faith by coming to Jesus Christ. For the Bible says in Hebrews 12 and 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, of course, this might look like a new plan, form of theology, but sometimes we need to look at this again. The man who came with the apostles, and they said to Jesus, increase our faith. I have not got faith unless the Lord gives it to me. Faith in the Scriptures in the book of Corinthians is a gift. And faith in the book of Galatians among the fruit is, is, is a fruit. In other words, how do I get faith? It's either going to be given to me by the Lord, or it's going to come upon me because I've had relationship with Him. It's a, it's a fruit of my relationship with Jesus Christ. That's simple, isn't it? When I, I was always told, and I'm allowed to examine the things that I've been taught over the years, that uh, to everyone is given the measure of faith. Yes, to everyone is given the measure of faith as you need it. Faith is not that muscle that you build in that psychological idea, but faith is something you get from Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Let me illustrate this to you. When I was a missionary up in Congo, in my early 20s, my wife and I were there, our old truck gave in. It had done about 250,000 miles, and it expired. It lay on the back part of our house like an alligator, determined never to rise again. I went to my wife and I said, you know, honey, we really need a good, reliable vehicle, something that we don't have to work on every five minutes. So I went up out of the mountain to pray, and I said these words, Lord, you said in your word, all things whatever you desire. How many people know that desire is a passion of your heart? That is hope. It's one of the steps that rises up to what faith really is. I said, I need, Lord, uh, Jesus, I really need a good, reliable car. And God answered me in my spirit, and he said, if you want a good, reliable car, you can have a good, reliable car. But if you want a brand new one, you can have a brand new one. I said, change the order, Jesus, please. <laughs> and I came down from the mountain, and two days later, a man who was a miner, a copper mine manager, came to me 
and bought me a brand new Volkswagen. Now, I understand that a Volkswagen is not really a car, it's Hitler's revenge on the world, but <laughs> it was a means of transport. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm illustrating to you? This as a human being went up the mountain with hope. I said I went up the mountain with hope, but when I met in the presence of the Lord, He turned my hope and He made it into faith. He gave me an assurance and I came down and I said, I know I've got a car. Hope number two in your notes waits patiently for God. Why don't we just redress that verse 35, 36 and 37 of Hebrews 10, cast not away therefore your confidence or your passionate desire, says the Greek, which have great recompense of reward. You're going to get rewarded for your hope. For you have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now, every time people see, oh, he that will come, oh, they escalate, your mind comes, and oh, Jesus is coming. Now, what is he saying? He says, you have need of patience. You're hoping for something, but it's not going to come immediately because you haven't done the will of God yet. You can hope for something for as long as you like, but you need to get your ducks in a row. And then he says that, then you'll receive the promise. And in verse 37, yet a little while he that shall come will come on not tarry. He says, God will come and he'll answer your hope if you'll hang in there and be patient. We're living in a press button society where everybody says we've got to have it now. Faith does not always operate now. God wants us to get in line first. The man at the pool of Bethesda was 38 years there waiting. And when Jesus came, I read in John 5 and 6, Jesus knew that he'd been there a long time. He said, wilt thou be made whole? Why did he say wilt thou? I want to know whether you've got hope. I want to know whether you have a desire whether you really believe in that you must be made whole. And when he said yes, then Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. The faith was when he heard the master say, do it. But he had to have hope first because you can never have faith unless you have hope first. Number three, hope may stagger, yet it never gives up. I understand that faith staggers, but let's deal with this first. Romans 4.18 says about Abraham, who against hope he believed in hope. How many know that Abraham and his wife wanted a child at 100 years of age? Now, there are a lot of ridiculous things in the Bible, but that's probably the most ridiculous I've ever read. <laughs> if I woke up tomorrow and find my wife was pregnant, I'd throw myself off a cliff. <laughs> but <laughs> they wanted a baby. And I have no doubt that everybody said it's an impossibility. There was a hope within him. And the Bible says against hope he believed in it. When he got advice that it couldn't be, he never gave up his hope. It wasn't faith yet, but he had hope. And you, you must hang on to hope. For the Bible says in, in Hebrews 6 and 19, we have a hope, we have an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth within the veil. What I do with my hope, I take it into the presence of Jesus in prayer, and I anchor it in there so that nobody can take my hope from me. There's a lot of people want to take your hope from you. Speak to Caleb and Joshua. In the book of Numbers, when they come back from the promised land, the people said, man, we cannot do it. But they stilled the minds of them and they held to their hope and they knew they were going into the land. I believe that when people speak to us, we must not allow them to remove our hope. My son-in-law, who's an Olympic swimmer, Never in a day's illness in his life at 42 years of age has a cancerous tumor on the brain and the doctors have operated. They said, we'll give you two weeks or two months. I know that's the case, but against hope, we're believing in hope. And he will live because we've brought our hope before the Lord of glory. Spurgeon, that great Baptist preacher, prayed for two men for years. People said they will never get saved, but he never gave up hope. One of them was saved two two weeks before Spurgeon died and the other was saved at his funeral. God will honor your hope. Don't give up. You may not have faith yet, but if you hang on to hope, Jesus can turn it into faith. You have a human ability to hope in God. Fourthly, hope understands divine sovereignty. 
Now, why on earth do we use such big words like marmalade and furniture here? Sovereignty is a, is a theological term which means God will have his way. In, the, in 1 John 5 and 14 it says, and this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Hope understands this, that when you go to God with something and you want it very badly, you need to check out whether it's in the will of God. Yeah. Honey, you remember you wanted that man. You hoped for that man. You took that man. Now you've got an idiot because you married the wrong man. It's always good to pray the prayer whether you think it's messianic or not. The Lord's prayer in Matthew 6, 10, Lord, thy will be done on heaven which is on earth. The faith message said everything is mine because the Bible says all the promises of God are yea, yea, amen. You need to check that out. All the promises are yes and amen are if they're in the will of God. Come on. God's not a yes, yes, yes God. He's not a Dr. Spock. Sometime we've got to check out whether it's in the will of God. David, I always used to marvel at 2 Samuel 12 and 16. David had taken another man's wife and had him murdered. And there was a child conceived in that illicit gain. And when the child was born, it was sick. And David, the Bible says, fasted. He lay upon all night upon the earth. But even though he fasted in the seventh day, the Bible says the child died. See, when David prayed, he brought his hope to God. And God said, David, I call you to surrender your hope. I'm not going to make it a promise that the child will live. My will is that the child dies. Now that really is in conflict to you, but I enjoy upsetting you. But there are times when the answer is no, because God knows best and he will not contravene the truth and his holiness. Don't think you can push God around. He's not a computer. He's a sovereign God. He'll do what he wants to do because he knows what's best for you. I have three daughters and a son. My second daughter is like my mother-in-law. It's the genes, you see. And when she was doing nursing, she came to me and said, Daddy, I want a motorbike. I said, Honey, you're not having a motorbike. You will have four wheels or no wheels. And she was ugly to me, like my mother-in-law. It's the genes, you see. She said, Well, I'm buying one. And I gave it great opposition. She said, yeah, my friend bought one and I'm buying one. She came to me a week later and said, Daddy, I'm not buying one. My friend bought one and went under a five-ton truck and killed herself. I said, honey, you see, Dad knows best. And how many people know your heavenly Father knows those things that you're in need of? You need to bounce it off on Him first and see whether it's the will of God. Bring your hope to God. I know you feel you need it. But God, the answer may be no. You can be rebellious. You can be aggressive as a Christian. But I want to tell you what, you can even walk out on God with a pout. But God, you will not push around for he's a sovereign God. Hope becomes faith when God speaks personally. But you know the scripture well, Romans 10, 17. Now faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I know in context it's speaking about people who hear the word of God for the preaching of the gospel. But people, if they hear the word of God, we need God to quicken it with divine faith. Otherwise, it'll make no difference to them. You see, uh, th there's so many scriptures. But in other words, faith is, um, is knowing for sure the provision of God. It's an assuring word. It says in Romans 4.20 about Abraham to illustrate it to you. He staggered not at the promise of God or the word spoken uh, to him. In other words, faith is hearing God, bring your hope and hearing God say, this is it. You have got it. Do you remember Peter when he walked on the water? He, he said in Matthew 14, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come to thee. That wasn't unbelief. By the way, unbelief is not the opposite of faith. Uh, unbelief is the opposite of hope. It's all in the soul realm. It's part of the desire. But it leads up to faith. But you cannot put it in the same basket. 
He said, he said, Lord, if it be thou, Lord, I've got a hope to walk on water. When Jesus said, come, that is when it, hope turned into faith because he heard the word of the Lord. I was teaching in a college in Dallas and some great charismatic preacher got up and said, faith is like standing on a diving board and you dive and suddenly you realize there's no water in the pool. And you believe before you hit the bottom, there's be water. That's dumb. I mean, faith is intelligent. Faith is not ridiculous. Are you there? Faith hears the word of God. It knows the facts and it acts upon those particular facts that it hears. It is a rhema word as it is called. I was called to Africa by this very second daughter with the bad genes. <laughs> She'd given birth to a third child, a little girl, and the child was dying because the doctors had given it a wrong medicine, and before the child was taken out of the hospital, the lining of the stomach was burnt away. Sometimes our medical world makes mistakes. And so she called my wife and I from the States, and we went over. By the way, they are living in the States now. But um, my wife spent time in fasting and prayer. I was called to speak at uh, a church in Cape Town, South Africa. And I left, distraught, seeing this child not able to drink or eat, and just fading away and dying. My daughter felt if mum and dad come over and they pray, perhaps God can do something. And I remember while I was in Cape Town, I, after the service that night, I went to bed and it, I'd taken my money and put it on the dresser and I fell into a deep sleep and at three o'clock in the morning, I woke up with the lights on. And people, when you've turned the lights off and they're on when you wake up, you must know you have company. <laughs> and I looked and there was a, a man standing there with bare feet, just with a pair of uh, long trousers on and a short sleeves shirt. And he looked at me, he said, money. And he had a knife in his hand. I wasn't going to argue. I pointed to the dresser and he moved across the room. And as he got to the money, the whole room went pitch black again. I thought, we have more than one in the room. <laughs> I dived out of bed, hit the light switch, and there was nobody in the room. Now, I believe in visions and dreams. The Bible declares so. I didn't realize it, but God had given me a vision. And I got out and I said, Lord, what is it? And the Lord said, like that thief came to steal, the devil's come to steal your grandchild. And the Lord said, if you will get down on your knees now and bind the principle of death, I will honor it. How many people know I heard God? How many people know I had a word from God? And when you've had a word from God, you are as bold as a lion. I had an assurance. I went, I had hope, brother, but now I had the real thing. I had the title deeds. And then the Lord told me something strange, brother. He said, I want you to tell your daughter tomorrow morning at seven, take the child, bathe it, and wrap it up in a sheet. Just the head showing. And then tell to give the child watery pumpkin or squash. I said, all right, Lord, I'll do I, I knew it was God. No, I, I know nothing about bringing up children. I know nothing about the medical, but I knew God told me. So I called my daughter. She said, Dad, if I give this child water, it will die. I said, honey, and if you don't do anything, how long will the child live? She said, till five tonight. I said, well, you might as well do what your dad says. Dad, I'm not doing it. It's the genes, you see. <laughs> she said, all right, Dad, I'll do it. Two hours later, I got a call from her. She said, Dad, you won't believe this. That child is eating the watery pumpkin, and it's so amazing. She, she, she's picking up. I said, I told you. <laughs> By the way, that child is living in the United States now. Is 16 years of age, has been picked for the, the Olympics. And the part that thrills me, she's giving her mother the same hell that her mother gave me. <laughs> Hope 
purpose desire number six born in the soul now you know when I read Mark 11 24 Jesus said whatsoever things he desire desire is a soulish passion of hope when you pray you've got to pray believing that's also part of hope that you receive you shall have them you see what you must understand that your hope are you with me must be brought to God in prayer not in just simple confessions and charismatic chanting you have got to bend your knee and make time to meet God in prayer and bring your hope to God and tell him about it Jesus had just cursed the fig tree and he said you can do the same in verse 22 he said have faith in God and we all know the translation means have the faith of God says another translation receive the faith of God when you come to prayer you take your hope and God turns it into faith and you receive his faith to accomplish what you want to do he goes on and he speaks about if you say to this mountain uh, be thou removed and cast in the sea and doubt not but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. You, you can't just speak to a mountain. You've got to go to God first and tell him, Lord, hey, is this your will to move the mountain? And did you hear what I said? Is this your will? And if he says, yes, that's my will, you've got the assurance, get out there and move the mountain. But if you had said, I'm a mountain mover, bless God, I'm a charismatic, you look an idiot when that mountain doesn't move. And we have a lot of charismatic idiots. They try to move a mountain if they never checked it out with God. I think we should always understand that hope is human and faith is divine and it's only God who can do it. A great friend of mine who was in the Church of God in South Africa in the city of Durban his church was running 8,000. That's a lot of people. His daughter played the piano. And one night, before thousands of people, she dropped dead at the piano. That's tragedy. She had a brain hemorrhage. And he got over her and commanded death to go. But she lay there dead. Am I mocking the movement? No, but I believe whatever happens, we need to check it out with the great head of the church first. And so he gave word over national television that at the Stellawood Cemetery, he would raise his daughter from the dead and quoted all the subsequent scriptures. Got there and I was there and he stood with his men around the casket like the prophets of Baal screaming and shouting and the child never rose from the dead do you know the disgrace it brought to the gospel did you know the negative speech and people began to mock it he's not in the ministry today either that was a sad thing you see what my dear friend did not understand was that he had hope but he hadn't brought it into the throne room to check out whether it was God's will if you bring me a dead person, say, come on, boy, you got faith. You raise this person to the dead. I say, who told you to come to me? Okay? And if God's told me to raise the dead, I'll do it. You say, well, don't you believe in the raising of the dead? I was there when Nicholas Bengu, the great black Billy Graham of Africa, raised a woman from the dead who'd been dead five days. I believe it. I believe it most of all because Jesus was raised from the dead. I'm going to tell you something that Harold Berry, Smith Wigglesworth's son-in-law, told me. We were missionaries together in Africa. He said that Smith Wigglesworth went to the service one morning, his wife wasn't well. And after he preached, the deacons met him and said, your wife died while you were away. And he walked to the home, the manse was not far away. And the men followed behind him. They got into the house, up the stairs. And Wigglesworth got to the bed and she was dead. The doctors were there. Uh, there, there, was, there was absolutely no doubt about it. She'd gone to be with the Lord. And Smith fell down on his knees in his rugged, passion way. He said, oh God, I never said goodbye to her. And Lord, please, uh, j just let, let me say goodbye. And the Lord said to him in his heart, Smith, you can do that. You can raise her from the dead for a little while, and then I'm taking her home because that's my will. 
And he said, woman, arise. And she didn't only sit up in bed, she threw her feet over and she got out and kissed him. And then she said, I'm going to be with the Lord, put her feet back like Jacob in the bed and went home to be with the Lord. Of course God can do it. But hope does not contravene the sovereignty of the living God. Are you folks with me? Number seven, hope is believing, but faith hears it's done. Now, uh, what, what, this is subtle. In Hebrews 10, 22, it says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. You see, what hope does is this. It presents its request to God, believing that God will do what's asked. But listen to what happens here. But faith acts upon the divine response. You see, faith is not just getting things from God. There are many things it is. It's also a conduct and a lifestyle. It's also the doctrine of purity. It's not just getting red Cadillacs. If you read the whole of the book of Hebrews 11, every one of those men acted in faith. They were obedient to do something that God said they should do. And some of you might be struggling with this because you did a few years in Tulsa. Now what you've got, you need to keep, but just get it straightened up. Faith sometimes is hearing God say, I want you to do something. I'd like you to give $1,000 to somebody. I, 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 are you going to do it? If you've heard God, when, when Hebrews 4.2 says, the word did not profit the children of Israel, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. They didn't want to go over. They didn't want to obey what they'd heard. I had property in Africa. My wife and I went over. God told us to sign all our property over to the black people of the land. We've done it. We're very happy. We're broke, but we're happy. Are you out there? You've you got to do what God tells you to do. When I was a young missionary, there were copper mines up on Congo border. And in the early 50s, there was a polio epidemic. And a copper miner's daughter, Elaine Drew, she was 13 years of age, was paralyzed totally from the neck down with polio. And the people began to pray. One morning at four o'clock, I woke up to pray for Elaine, and I heard the Lord tell me something as a young man. He said, I want you to travel the 30 miles to the hospital, and I want you to go into that place with the iron line. I want you to put your hand on her head, and I want you to pray, and I will raise her up. My wife's father is a wonderful man of God. That time he's gonna be with the Lord. He said, Don, let me give you advice. I wouldn't go. It's a contagious thing. My wife begged me not to go, but I'd heard God and I knew it. And I was either going to obey it or not obey it. I went, prayed for Elaine Drew, and six hours later they took her out of the iron lung, and she's still living to this day because I obeyed the voice of God in the face of all the religious world. <laughs> Hope is another thing. It's trusting in what God is able to do. If you don't believe that God's able, nothing's going to happen. The blind men, and Jesus turned to them in Matthew's gospel in 9 and 28, and he said to them, believe you that I'm able to do it. Is there a sense of believing? That's hope. That's not faith. It's in the soul realm. Believe you that I can do it. If you don't believe God can, you, you, you're getting nowhere. Do you understand? It sees all things as possible, does hope. Faith doesn't see. Faith knows it's possible. But hope believes that it can be done and makes a prayerful approach to God for that need to be met. And it culminates in faith as its wonderful reward. Jesus said, if thou canst believe, if you can have a hope in your heart, all things are possible. Yes. Now, you say, well, Don, I have really faith, but you've got hope today. Every one of you got hope. Don't give it up. I mean, the Bible says in Proverbs, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. People will try and get you to give it up. But hang on to God. Keep swimming. I only had one boy. He's fortunate to have my genes. And when he was five, he took a bucket of water, brother, and took a big African frog and threw it in the bucket of water. And the frog swam round and round and round. And then this little boy has a cruel streak in him. 
like his father. He put the lid on the bucket and the frog was dead in five minutes because it lost hope. When the lights go out, don't let your hope die. Hang on to God. In the darkness of the hour, let's sing in the prison. Hang on to God. Never give up on your hope. You may not have faith yet, and people will tell you haven't got it, but people, you've got the hope that God instilled in you as a human being. Hope thou in God, the scripture says. My wife came out and said, I want to tell you if you ever do that again, I will kill you. That's how we brought our children up. All of them have finished college. All of them are married once. Are you there? Because we said, we will kill you. <laughs> My wife said, don't do that again. He said, yes, ma. So he got another frog and he put it in the bucket. My wife said, I'm watching you. And the frog was swimming round and round. My wife called him for lunch. He looked at his frog and he went inside. And while we were having lunch, there was a rainstorm. And the bucket filled up with water. And the frog got out and ran away. Very poor theological display, but let me tell you something. If you're in the bucket, keep swimming. God's going to send the rain, man. And the devil won't get you. You can get away. <laughs> I'm not giving up. On one of my trips to the United States from Central Africa, where I spent most of my time, I got to Johannesburg, had a 48-hour layover uh, for my flight to the States. Lady contacted me, she said, uh, are you Don Norman? I said, yes. She said, my son's dying in hospital cancer. Would you come and pray for him? Wife and I got there. There was a young man there, 26 years of age. He was six foot six tall and weighed 130 pounds. He was emaciated with cancer. They'd cut his stomach open, stitched him up. You could smell the cancer, see the putrefying uh, wound. There, I know I've been a military chaplain. I've been a missionary. I, I've been a pastor. I, I, I tell you what, I knew he was going to die. So I, I did the most noble thing. I led him to Christ. And as I walked away, he said, Pastor, he said, aren't you going to pray for me? I, I, I'm believing God for healing. Man, I went back and I prayed one of those hypocritical pastoral prayers. One of those that you know, you know, it's just a, a recitation. I knew it didn't work. And that night flying over, I said to my wife, we'll never see him again. My wife said, you're right about that. Two years later, we were on another trip to the United States and we had to go to Johannesburg, another 48 hour layover. And to kill time, we heard Andre Crouch, that musician. And during the interval, there were 3,000 people there. We were standing in the foyer. Suddenly, the crowd began to bustle, and a big guy began to push his way through the crowd. And he looked at me, he said, Don Norman. He looked at me, it was a big guy. He looked at me like a dog looks at a bone. <laughs> and he rushed forward, and I weighed 212 pounds. He just picked me up like I was a featherweight and he shook me he said you remember me I said son he put me down I'll remember you <laughs> I said who are you he opened up his white shirt he said look I'm the guy who had cancer and you prayed for me two years ago and God healed me <laughs> I took my glasses off and looked at him I said did he I really didn't understand that. I went back to our motel room that night and I began to pray. I said, Lord, what is it? And God gave me a vision. Now, God only gives visions to stupid people because they don't understand. <laughs> I really, I didn't understand, and nor do you. So don't tell me that you're so smart either. <laughs> and the Lord showed me a mailman coming to me with an envelope. 
and he gave me this envelope and I opened it and there was a check in there for $100,000. The Lord said, you don't thank the mailman for the check. You find out who sent it. And the Lord said, when you went to that boy and you put your hands on him, I'll tell you what happened. You were the mailman. But he said, I gave the healing. You were just the delivery boy. Now, how do you become a delivery boy? When you wake up in the morning and you meet with God in prayer, God can put gifts in you that you may not know that you're getting. But if you don't meet God, you cannot expect to be carrying gifts. And if you've got a gift from the Lord, the Bible says He gives them several as He will. You need to be giving them away and going next morning, get some more gifts to give away. I'm a, I, you don't mind if I'm a little contradictory. I'm allowed to be. I get tired of preachers saying, man, I got the gift of healing. Nobody's permanently got any gifts. All the permanent gifts are in the Holy Ghost. So, but I, I've got to shake it in my hands. You, you just got the DTs, dear. You got over emotional. You don't get faith, but from Jesus. You don't get anything, but from the true vine. You're just a branch giving forth the fruit of the Son of the living God. Are you folks out there? I've got two more things to say and then I'll let you go. And I'm going to the Red Lobster. <laughs> Hope has no disappointment. I, what I mean, you know, if you put your hope in the Lord, even though you haven't got faith yet. Now, you know, so many people condemn yourself because you just haven't got the big time faith. That's all right, as long as you've got hope in God. And all of you have got that. You'll never be ashamed if you put your trust in the Lord. That means your hope. Because eventually the Lord will come through and confirm that to you. And God will reward you. It says, Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder. He's a rewarder of them. God will reward you. And Romans chapter 5 and verse 5 says, hope maketh not ashamed. You'll never be ashamed because you put your hope in the Lord. Yes. Never. Well, when it says in Hebrews 6, uh, Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, let me translate. Without the faith that you've received from the Lord Jesus in prayer, it's impossible for you to please the Father. Is that all right? Uh, but if you will hope, I mean, you may not know everything about the Bible. In fact, you've only read the four Gospels. But if you've got hope, you can get something from God. I remember when I was first saved, 18th of February, 1952. My wife was a Baptist. I was a Catholic boy. I, I, I was a mechanical engineer. And our oldest daughter was crushed in a motor wreck. She had internal hemorrhage of the brain. She had a fissure of the skull. She had blood pouring from her ears and her nose and her eyes and her mouth. Head was swollen to twice the size. Doctor showed me she was paralyzed. I don't want to go into the intricacies of it. But I want to tell you what I took. My wife's Bible went down into my mum and dad's wine cellar, fell on my face before God and read John's gospel. I realized that, hey, this Jesus is alive. You out there? I read in John 1 that he was the word. In John 2, he could turn the water into wine. In John 3, he told he had to get born again. In John 4, he told the woman there, go call thy husband. And in John 5, that he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda. In John 6, he fed people with bread. In John 7, he said, I'll give you the Holy Ghost. In John 8, he set a woman free from adultery. In John 9, he said a man gave him eyes when he couldn't see. In John 10, he said, I'm the good shepherd. In John 11, he said, I'm the resurrection. In John 12, he said, I've got power over the devil. In John 13, he says, you can be with fruit. In John 14, he said, I'm coming again. In John 15, he's the great Lord. Is that right? In John 16, he, he says, I'll give you the Holy Ghost to convict you of sin. In John 17, he said, I'm praying for you. In John 18, he witnessed before Pilate. In John 19, they put him on a cross. In John 20, he rose again. Thomas said, except I shall see the nail prints in his hand, I'll not believe. And Jesus appeared to him again. He said, Thomas, put your finger in my hand. Be not faithless, but believing. He said, have some hope in me. And Thomas fell down and said, my Lord and my God. He said, I've been to follow you for three years, but today you're my Lord. And I tell you what, my little girl, the sweating wall went down on the third day. On the sixth day, the dent stopped moving on the, with the heartbeats. And on the 16th day, I walked in there and her, I, she was incoherent. Her eyes were out of focus. Suddenly her eyes focused. She called me daddy and kicked both her legs. Let me tell you something.
That little girl is 48 years of age today. She is perfectly well. She's the wealthiest in our family and doesn't give me a penny. <laughs> but let me tell you something. When Jesus does something, he does it perfectly and he does it well. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth or will make their hope. And I close with this. Hope precedes faith to be saved. I make a contradictory statement that will not make me popular. This could make me as popular as a pork chop in a synagogue, I guess. Have you ever heard people say, come up to the front. Evangelists do this all the time. I did it too, so it's all right. You did it and you're always wrong. You know that. <laughs> come up and get saved by faith. We're not saved by faith. Oh, but preacher, what about Ephesians 2, 2, 8? It says we're saved by faith, doesn't it? It says, for by grace are you saved through faith. There's a difference. I've had people come down here and, and beat their chest to bits trying to get faith to get saved and go out unsaved. You are not saved by faith. Why don't you write in your notes this morning, Romans 8, 24, we are saved by hope. Terribly quiet over here. I don't feel welcome. <laughs> you see, what is hope? Hope is a passionate desire of the soul. Of an individual. You can never get saved unless you hope to get saved. Unless you want to get saved. Unless you're hungry to get saved. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now when you really want to be saved, Jesus will come along and give you the faith to get saved. Is that all right? Don't put the cart before the horse. I teach at colleges all over the States and Canada and England. And I can come to the university people and say to them, I can prove to them conclusively, mathematically, scientifically, geographically, historically, every way that Jesus is the savior of the world. And they won't accept it because they don't want him yet. It's not information people need. They need to have an experience which will bring them to a place where they're forced to have God. We have not seen the revival yet that America is going to have. As we go into the year 2000, we shall see urban terrorism. That people will forget about the stock market. People will forget about everything because there'll be a fear in the hearts of men to want God. I've never known anybody who really wants God without going through some traumatic thing in their life. You can go to the mall in the scriptures in the book of Acts. Cornelius sent for Peter because he was hungry for God. It's hungry people who God will give faith to get saved. Many years ago, about 45 years ago, I heard this and read it in an American paper. Maybe it's forgotten, some of you may remember it. But in Los Angeles, there was a prominent lawyer, and with this I bring it to a conclusion. And this lawyer, his wife was tragically killed in a motor wreck. And it caused him to become an alcoholic wasn't long before he lost his legal practice and his place at the bar and began to walk the streets. People recognized him as old Jim and his tattered and torn clothes, his broken sneakers. Parents would point out to their children on a Sunday afternoon drive, that's old Jim, he used to be a prominent lawyer before liquor got hold of him. Everybody knew who Jim was. One morning, the janitor was cleaning the church early at sunrise. And suddenly the great big back wing doors of the city church opened. And who should appear 
is a silhouette in the doorway but old Jim unshaven unclean hair disheveled he made his way down the aisle and he fell on his knees at the front and he lifted his hands and he said Jesus this is Jim Jesus this is Jim Jesus this is Jim how many know that hope cries out with passionate desire turn around and walked out and the janitorial person went to the past and said you know Jim's up to no good he may come back tomorrow and the preacher came and he hid behind the choir rail and yes as it was predicted at sunrise the doors opened again and who should come down the aisle but Jim and he fell on his knees at the front and he lifted his hands with hope and passion and desire and he said Jesus this is Jim Jesus this is Jim Jesus this is Jim turned around and shuffled out the pastor said tomorrow I'll speak to him the next day you could time your clock with it how many people know when people have hope they never give up they never give up they keep swimming when the doctors have said it's all over, they keep on going. And Jim came the third morning and the doors opened. The pastor was still behind the choir rail. Jim came down, tears coursing down his cheeks. He said, Jesus, this is Jim. And Jesus, this is Jim. And Jesus, this is Jim. Turned round, slowly made his way down. The pastor was overwhelmed. He should have done something, but it was too late. As he got to Jim's, Jim had got out into the streaming traffic of the early morning commuters to work. And the preacher said, tomorrow I'll speak to him. But tomorrow never came. As the preacher picked up the evening newspaper, he read Jim City Tramp, ex-lawyer, dying in hospital. He'd been run over by a passing vehicle. It was too late, but the preacher made his way to the hospital. When he got there, Jim was unconscious. He had needles in his arms and tubes in his eye, in his nose, and it was too late. And as the preacher stood at the foot of the bed, forlorn and depressed, suddenly Jim opened his eyes. Those blue eyes sparkled, and he just said these words. It's all right, preacher. It's all right. He said, because before you came, there was another man at the end of my bed. And he lifted his hands and he said, Jim, this is Jesus. Jim, this is Jesus. Jim, this is Jesus. And he closed his eyes and went down through the valley of the shadow of death. Hope, you'll never be ashamed. Never give up to you, even though Christians will talk you down. Against hope, believe in hope. Bring your hope with a bended knee and pray to God and find out His sovereign divine will. God has made you a human with a desire for Him. Let's stand for prayer. Father in heaven, the people today who have heard me minister this simple word, a profound truth, but a simple word. God, let, let folks know today that though they've broken the laws of God and their marriages have come unglued and they feel like they're an outcast, that God, they can turn around and tell you their name and you know who they are. God, let them bring their hope to you. It's not too late while they've breath within their nostrils, while heads are bowed and every eye is closed. Put your hands down, everybody, please. I'm your brother, your servant, and I want to ask you, could I pray for you where you are? There's too many people in the front, but I, I, at time I'd like to see you afterwards. But I want to pray for you. Say, Don, I didn't know that God loved me that much. Yes, he does. And you're not abnormal. You, you're not without hope. God loves you today, and you can exercise that hope. Bring it back into your life. But put your hope first on the Lord Jesus for his blood to wash away your sins, and for him to give you his faith that you might get saved. 
say, Don, I want that right now, then put your hand up and, to be saved. And I, I, I'll pray for you. Yes, there's a gentleman there and a gentleman there and a lady there. The, the, the gentleman there, people all over the house of God. Let me see your hands. Keep them up high. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for the privilege today. It is a privilege, my God, to pray for these people and to minister the word of life. Let your blessings that make rich and add no sorrow be theirs. Let the blood wash away every sin. Let the Holy Spirit come upon them, giving them a divine confidence that they passed from death unto life. And thank you for what you're doing now. You're healing sick bodies and doing everything as people now put their hope in you, Lord. Turn it into faith in Christ's name. And everybody says? Amen. And everybody says? Amen. Give the Lord a hand, would you do that? And make sure it's for the Lord Jesus. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Before I hand over to Pastor Richard, I, I want to tell you that the books and tapes are out there and you're welcome to do it. Uh, check up which one you want. You can write out a check if your check balances. I know that Pastor John will have me back again and I'll get you on the second time round. <laughs> By the way, the book on, on where lions feed there's a story about my brother there. I think Pastor John might have told it. My brother Peter, we were out one night hunting and my dad said, Pete, you must be back before sundown and he never came back that night. But uh, he, my brother tells a story that he got out into a place between the valleys and he met three lion head on. They were male and female and a very big cub. And my brother said, Don, there was only one tree round about. My brother's very agile. And he ran for that tree. And he said the lowest branch was 20 feet up. He said, Don, I jumped for that branch and I missed it. But he said, I caught it coming down. There's some amazing stories in that book where lions feed. I have, um, I have run from lion. I have soiled my underwear because of lion. But how many know the, de the devil walks around like a roaring lion? And this will be a great help to you. The marriage tapes are very humorous. If you're religious, I wouldn't buy those. Is that all right? There's a book there called Jacko the Baboon. I've written another one called Tommy and the Chickens. Uh, I, I'm, I'm writing on Isaiah, a textbook for the college that I'm teaching at. And I don't get paid well for writing my textbooks, but you know my kids' books, I really get paid well. And that book has brought me in over $1,000 a month. So I said, well, I'm gonna write another one. It was, I'm very mercenary. But um, that book's $5. It's about a little baboon. He's a wicked little guy and he doesn't do what his mother says. You there? How many know you catch baboons with a pumpkin? You drill a hole in a pumpkin and he fills his hand with the seed and then he runs with a pumpkin on his hand and then you've got him. That's how your mother got you, isn't that right, brother? <laughs> and um, this little guy disobeys his mother, goes to the pumpkin fields. Eventually he's going to die and he gets saved. And it ends, he becomes a preacher. Which means that before you can become a preacher, you have to be a baboon first and then you get it. Uh, but I, I've given this book out to people on the plane. A lawyer, I, I gave it to him and he read it to his two little girls and he got saved. So it's for the unintelligent as well, you understand? <laughs> a, an elderly lady of 92, a German lady, read it to her great-grandchildren and she got saved. It's just a kid's book. But I will say this, if you're a single mother or single parent, and you have a child with you and they want that book, then you don't have to pay for it. Ask the ladies at the table. It would be just my joy to give that to you. And those who would like to see me, I'll, I'll be out at the table there and uh, you can speak to me as long as you speak to me nicely. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor.
Have you enjoyed that this morning? Praise the Lord. Everybody stand with me, please. Father, I just bless. I bless our people this morning. Lord, I ask that you would continue to enlarge their heart for the things of God. Father, let our hope not be deferred. But Lord, may we always hope in God. Father, I thank you that you will never fail us. You will never leave us. I pray this week, Lord, the blessings of the Lord overtake you. May he give you favor in the public place. May he, may he provide, keep you healthy, whole. May he use you powerfully this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Look for you Tuesday night at prayer meeting as well. God bless you this morning.